All right. Hi. Um, I'm here today with Max Robinson. Hello, Max. Hi, I'm Max. So um, I'm here today for what I believe is a momentous occasion um, for detransition history, which is I'm pretty sure that um, Max has completed and published the first book on detransition by a detransitioner. I think I think that's right. Um, so Max, for public for public consumption, I think I think for you public know, consumption. There was the there was the there was the uh, blood vision zine that was for Mitch Fest distribution. That's right. And they sold it some, but they were they had their distribution vision. That's true. That was a little bit of like a secret community tome, but this one yeah, and they had like a specific audience, like that wasn't it wasn't public consumption oriented. Mm hmm. So the, and this one, this book is for is for everyone to check out. I think it's especially for detransitioners um, and it's called uh, Detransition um, Beyond Before and After. And it's a really amazing book. I just read it. Um, but first, I would like to just give Max an opportunity. Do you want to introduce yourself to those who may not be familiar with you? Yes. Okay. Um, I am Max. <laughs> I'm Max Robinson. Um, I transitioned as a teenager and detransitioned pretty early into adulthood. And uh, getting connected with feminist organizing has been really, really helpful for me. And getting connected with detransition women's kind of peer support, structured networking was really huge for me. So this is an attempt to communicate what I took away from those experiences. Yeah. In um, terms of the <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is this is a really incredible book because I think we've seen, you know, I, I both of us have had experiences, you know, being interviewed in the media and sort of experienced what it is to have, you know, this like very personal experience kind of processed by like the journalism kind of machine and like turned into something that people can understand in a few sound bites. Um, and this book goes a lot deeper into, I think, both like your personal story and your personal philosophy um, in a way that I think a lot of D-trans people will really appreciate. Um, so I guess if, if I can start, if I can start with that, um, you've, you've kind of done like zines before, right? You've like, you're not, you're not at all new to uh, publishing about this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I've, how did I mean, it, I've done little smaller stuff and self-publishing stuff, but not, not this, this was, this was new. Uh-huh. So how, how did it, um, how did it feel to like, I don't know, put it all on the page of this like really personal, you know, emotionally felt journey. That's crazy. I don't know. It was really crazy. I wrote it all like, like most of it I wrote during, um, like downtime at really <laughs> kind of intense caregiving jobs. But you know, if someone's watching TV or sleeping, then you're just kind of sitting there. Yeah. Um, so I just wrote it in like little paragraph, like three paragraph chunks in like a notes app with no formatting. And then Kitty like edited it all into an actual normal book structure. I don't know. It was, it was intense. It was, and part of why I did it at all was because of how frustrating the media thing was. And also because I felt like, I don't know, I noticed in myself, like in, in thinking that I had to do the media stuff in order to contribute to the conversation, I kind of felt like looking at it, looking back at it, like it's kind of a weird learned helplessness thing. It's like, you have to make these concessions to be heard, you know, mm -hmm. whereas it, the, the more feminist position would be that you can, you know, look for a way to get your point across that doesn't require all those concessions. So it was an attempt to, you know, having to compromise so much. Yeah, it really struck me how much the book was, um, I mean, it, it kind of had so much of the like feminist rhetoric that I have like seen kind of floating around in feminist detransition communities and like blog posts and, you know, kind of like in that fragmented internet form. I feel like you really like, um, really like kind of brought it all together in a way that's very understandable and very clear. Um, it's just something that I really enjoyed seeing on the page. Um, and uh, 
something that I, I really appreciated that you talked about is you you had expressed frustration with both you know being co-opted by the conservative media and being used for you know conservative ends but also with some of the depictions of um like the liberal media um i was curious if you would i guess tell me what was most frustrating about that and like how if you feel like you were able to sort of remedy that in the in your book how did you you know what have you tried to emphasize that that the journalists left out yeah, I feel like the more, you know, there's just all the different forms of how people want to use this in the ways that that flattens it. But the kind of more liberal version of it is that it's okay to acknowledge sometimes at most, it's okay to acknowledge that some of us had a bad time and that it didn't work for everyone and that some people were harmed. But in order to acknowledge that, in order to make that okay, they have to make us into these like special crazy victims. <laughs> like we have to be differentiated from other trans people, mm -hmm. you know? It has to be totally, we, have, we just have to be put to the side it can't have relevance to anyone's narrative but our own. And it gets also gets used to prop up the idea that there is like a perfect kind of gatekeeping that would prevent detransition from happening and people from feeling harmed by like the medical aspects of their transition. And mm -hmm. I don't personally believe that, you know, I mean, there's just not like when, it, when I think about the woman that I met through detransition organizing and the different FTMs I know who did or didn't continue transition, it's like, you can't, you can't predict it. There's people who felt that that way when they were three and we're clearly saying it from the time they were three who ended up hating it you know and there's right. people who you would you could very easily categorize as like a trender or whatever whatever you know who like you know 10 years down the road are still doing it you uh -huh. know who just pick it up one day and but but then they keep with it and they don't report having any harm from it so it's like this I don't know li the liberal angle is really into marginalizing the experience and making it irrelevant to as many people as possible Mm hmm. Um, yeah, the so you're you've been kind of critical of like therapy and psychology on the whole. Is that fair to say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is this is a really interesting like psychological, not psychological. Um, what am I what am I looking for? It's an interesting kind of uh, schism I feel like a lot of people are very like oh we could just like explore with therapy and I you know I don't think that like therapy itself personally I, I'm not like totally against it but you have a pretty like incisive feminist critique of like the entire institution um is I it, hate it I mean I know that I know other people get something from it I never have so I don't really have that angle as like a really real thing to me yeah you know um, and I, I do, I just, I just hate it. <laughs> so I, it was not useful to me. And I think there are a lot of very meaningful criticisms we made of it in general. I just think at best, it's like having a nice, useful friend. And I think generally it'd be better if you were getting that from someone who you were in a pure relationship with and not someone who is an authority figure, who's going to be an expert on your inner world. Like I'm just, the dynamics of it inherently really bother me. So, which is why I couldn't get anything from it, which is why I'm so snotty about it. So, you know, I mean, it's like. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I, I really appreciate through the book how much you've talked about like uh, the need to alleviate, you know, the suffering of what you once conceptualized as dysphoria through kind of like just the, the basic good, you know, foundations of a good life, like connecting, with friends and I know like women's community you've expressed is very important and I think uh you have a, a dog yeah yeah she's awesome um yeah no it's like because I I wasn't someone who was always very clear-cut I need to change sexes my whole life you know I mean I had a lot of things that I would look back and see as like warning signs or whatever but for me I was just fucking miserable right you know and then you get this narrative and you do have all the sex distress and stuff going on because of sexism and being like a teenage girl and whatever. Yeah. And it all makes sense. But it's like at the, at the beginning of it, before I had language for it, I was just fucking miserable because my life sucked, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, so addressing that is a pretty big part of it. Mm -hmm. And I really, uh, I, I, I totally feel you on this. Like it's not so much of stuff that is kind of like, scooted off into the realm of like a mental illness or 
gender dysphoria or something is so much more complex than just the realm of psychologists. Like you mentioned in the book, you talk about how you like resent the authority um, that they are supposed to have over people's life and experiences um, and how you've kind of like, you know, built, built a life um, without needing that and like on your own kind of terms. And a big part of that too, I think you've said is like feminist philosophy. Um, yeah. um, how, how do you feel like feminist sort of ideas have, have helped you in your sort of detransition and like, I don't know, just thriving in life process? It's just like making sense of stuff. Like when I was, when I was into trans stuff, it's like, I was just as intensely, you know, I, I'm someone who's likes having strongly held ideals and trying to implement yeah. them, you know, I mean, I was into it when I was into trans stuff, but even though like I, I had a really strong emotional urgency to buy in because that's how I had hope for like my future. And it's, I believed it was necessary to like support my friends and these other people who needed my support. It's like a lot of it didn't make sense very far down, you know, and you kind of have to do this like mental, like gymnastics to avoid all the parts where you can't really logically justify it. And mm -hmm. for me, it's like, I haven't really found that with feminism. It's like, it just makes sense. And it's like so much less of my brain being used to like try and keep everything arranged. So nothing doesn't make sense, you know? Um, and yeah, just, I don't know. It's, it's a more workable value system for me. Like when I'm, I'm really into implementing my values. And when I did that in the trans and queer spaces I was a part of, it was a complete shit show. You know I mean? You're like, you're like, sure. Anyone can live in my house. Um, I'll send nudes to you because you're suicidal. You know, it's like the implementation of those values doesn't uh, yeah. play out as well as like, you know, like have like implementing the stuff in like Sarah Hoagland's lesbian ethics versus, you know, <laughs> uh, what what's it called hot allostatic load like oh my god one of those one of those one of those works a little better you know so uh you've just described uh I feel like you've really just given like a uh evocative sketch of like a really nightmarish uh sort of ideological scene that you were living in um nudes because I'm suicidal oh my god um yeah that's, that's... they need them <laughs> you could save a life oh no oh no how did we how did we get into that As... is it okay to send breast pictures if I'm FTM and they're like oh no don't worry about that it's fine um when they're yeah. when they're lesbians <laughs> oh my god okay so that that is obviously like very kind of obviously like probably egregious to most people in in the audience but um I'm really glad that you've I guess found yourself in a less crazy scene because oh my god um and then, you know it's like we still have our problems but good god <laughs> the scale the 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 scale of the issues and the ratio of how you know the, the amount of time between incidents of sexual misconduct is you know I mean it's expanded drastically so and that's you know it's a step up for sure that's all we can hope for in this life <laughs> no um sorry that's a that's a grim joke but um it is no, it's, well, it's, you know it's grim but well something okay so just to to pivot a little bit something I really appreciated about your book and I think this is again this is something that like many detransition women will have experienced is you put yourself out there and people often have a certain reaction which is based like basically purely on your physical appearance and like maybe on your ability to like bear children but like they're like oh that's too bad like she used to be so cute like you know ah that you know she looks so bad now like no one will be attracted to her like that feels very much like the focus um and in your book you really reject that framing as the main harm of transition and uh you talk a lot yeah. about the idea of being okay as a strange woman um would you be willing to say a little bit more about that idea and how you've talked yeah, about and it that's like book? I mean that's you know 
they wanted to add, they wanted the title to be detransitioned so it could be search engine optimizable, you know? Um, yeah. And I was okay with it because I hate almost everyone else. So I like the idea of taking it from other people. Um, you know, I feel like, mo you know, it's like, then it's not Ryan, whatever, Ryan Morgan, or it's not it's whoever not the fuck, Brian Anderson, that's his name. It's not, it's not okay. whatever fucking asshole conservative doing it, who gets yeah. the title first. Now they all have to deal with my title being first. But um, yeah, it's like, that's the whole point was the beyond before and after thing is like the addressing transition, addressing transition and detransition through a lens other than the superficial and like visual. And it's just, that's that's a really shitty and sexist way to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Um, tell me the question again. I got distracted. Yeah. Well, just to say more about that, like, I think, um, you know, people sort of are focused on the surface and being like, oh, it's, you know, too bad. You look like a man now. But I think you are really good at conveying how it's not just like a oopsie, I look wrong now thing, but it it was more of a psychological process where you were trying to achieve something for yourself and then came to realize that this was not the way to do it. Um, yeah. So what, so what, I guess, what were you trying to do with transition and like, why did you realize that it was wrong? Um. I like, you know, I wanted to be happy. I wanted to have a life. Like I just felt, I felt extremely hopeless at that point in my life. I did not know what I was going to do or how I could make myself feel better. And transition just has the steps, you know, like mm -hmm. you've got, you've got a series of things you do. And at the end, you're yourself and you feel like yourself and you like when you see yourself and you aren't distracted by how much you hate yourself and your body all the time. And you just get mm -hmm. to live your life. That's what appealed to me. And I didn't end up, you know, ultimately I could have achieved that without transition had things gone a little differently and mm -hmm. I didn't need to continue transitioning to achieve it, you know? Mm -hmm. And the, I remember the, the strange woman thing. It's like, cause I work, I worked <laughs> not really now. Um, I worked in developmental disability support services. Um, mm -hmm. and for most people who I was doing services for, if they're confused with my appearance and they're repeatedly asking the question, I could generally solve it by just being like you look weird you know I mean they're they've been through special ed they've been in like employment enclaves and stuff like they they know some people look really different you know mm -hmm. regardless of kind of where they are that's a framing that makes sense to everyone and it's like I wish I could say that and not be regarded as <laughs> I wish that was socially appropriate to say to everyone it's like some people just fucking look weird you mm -hmm. know <laughs> it's like that's, yeah that's, that, that's all like it, as, as long as we're like a social we're social animals that have we're going to perceive norms and what's the most common way to be. There's always going to be people on the outside of that. And it just needs to be okay because it's never not going to be the case on any, on anything, on any measurable thing that you can see, somebody's going to be on the far side of it. Yeah. And I love, I love the way that you talk about that because you're saying like, just because I look strange to some people does not mean that I can't have a good life, that I can't be happy and like have meaningful relationships. And I just love the way that you break out of that frame and sort of, you know, be like, fine, whatever. I look weird. It's yeah. not that big of a deal. That's very, I feel like that is an empowering thing to absorb in like the real sense of the word empowering. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's like, the, that's from disability theory a lot too, is like the disability theory is big on that point And like the therapy criticisms, a lot of like anti-psychiatry stuff which like both of those things were useful to me in making sense of everything because mm -hmm. it's just such a like you know therapy has so much to do with it and like um basically I mean medical malpractice too which a lot of disability theory is really concerned with so um so uh this is kind of a digression uh we can cut this if it goes too off topic but I, I've worked with people with developmental disabilities too and um, I did both, I did like employment support and I did some direct service. We called it DSPs. Um, I forget yeah, what it yeah. stood for, but, um, I, I do think there's something really, I don't know, really, I, I don't know how to say this without sounding like, like without it sounding weird, but there really is something like kind of nice and like, you know, that makes you like appreciate everyone's sort of like common humanity and also the like awkwardness and strangeness inherent to all life 
by like working with such yeah. a, a broad range of people. I don't know. I, I I hope this doesn't sound like patronizing or something, but it is. It was no. I think it's you know it's true. It's like it's a if you're working in those fields, the range of how how people can look and behave is wider than it is for someone who doesn't a lot of the time. You know, and it doesn't mm-hmm. mean it makes it it illustrates to you that people can be all sorts of different ways, and that a, a lot of preconceived notions you have about what makes life valuable valuable or worth living, you know, are, are just different. People have things totally different and, and find value and have a good time. Like I did services for one guy who was like, you know, he was deaf and he was also, he was also autistic and he had grown up with family that was also deaf and autistic. So it wasn't like, he wasn't neglected. He wasn't abused, but he just wasn't inter- interested in interacting with us. Like that wasn't a part of his life. He talked to us when he wanted us to drive him to Burger King or go to, you know, take him to the car wash or whatever. But his interactions with us were totally utilitarian. He just, and he was fine that way. You know, I mean, it's mm-hmm. just like, you can just, it's interesting to meet people who have such a different concept of how they want to live. Mm-hmm. And it's like, that is, that's being a person, you know, <laughs> that's life. Yeah. Not everyone, not everyone needs the same things. Yes. And totally, I think too, with, um, you know, I haven't read a lot of disability theory, but certainly I think there's a way in which people who certainly who have disabilities are effectively sort of like sequestered away from mainstream society in these like care homes a lot of the time. I uh, I know that's not unilaterally the case, but I think a lot of the time people are kind of tucked away in, in their own little world and just to, yeah, just to see like there's there's a whole there's a whole range that's like far beyond kind of the neurotypical world and yeah that everyone is like can be living in really different ways and like have valuable important lives and just to experience that is it's good it's good it's it's, it it makes the difference I don't know like it's it's useful because it's like I mean that's that's reality that's living in reality is people are that diverse and people are that different and there are that many different ways to understand what makes life valuable and what's good about living you know like it's cool Mm -hmm. to see it and have it be real yeah and I think to bring it back to your book I really appreciated how you sort of like refuse to portray yourself as this like abject pitiable you know person I really I appreciated that you I think there was a line where you talked about I don't I don't have it written down but there was a line where you talked about how you basically feel okay with how you look now and you had a period of intense mourning for your mastectomy and you said now you feel pretty chill about it and you just basically were like just like rejecting the idea that you were some sort of like pitiable person you were like really have a real sense of dignity in the writing um have you have you felt like you've had to like fight to reclaim that identity as like I don't know, a, a person with a full life is, has it been like difficult with the media stuff? Yeah. It's like, so, I don't know. They want us to be all about how like traumatized and psycho you are and how, hor- you know, you're ruined. It's, it happened to you because you're crazy. And now that it happened to you, you're physically and mentally ruined, you know? Uh huh. And like, that is the most useful part of the story for their purposes, but it's not true of very many people like it's it sucks I mean it's a horrible thing to go through it fucking sucks but like people in general I mean we're very resilient animals we like blanketed the earth you know it's like people generally get back to a baseline at some point and there's a lot of other things going on in their life and if not right away then a few years down the road you know Mm -hmm. like nobody really nobody's I don't know to the extent I don't know it's just like people who are ruined by this like there's a lot of other things going on and a lot of other it's just the idea that this experience inherently makes you have nothing else going on is crazy (laughs) that's not uh yeah I've seen people yeah I've seen people have a really hard time with the transition and I I don't want to minimize that right no I mean it's not that it doesn't suck like but I love, I love how much you are kind of spreading a message of hope and resilience. Um, and I don't know if you like, if you could go back, if you could go back and like talk to young Max when you were like first in the sways of, I don't know, maybe even in the sways of thinking about transitioning when you were a teenager, like knowing what you know now and like knowing what you thought of, like, what would you talk to her about? 
I mean, a lot, I try, I really tried in the book because it's like, I only, I have the best understanding of my, you know, my personal issues rather than someone else's. So a lot of that is what would have been useful for me to hear and addressing my own, you know, what my concerns were and what was confusing to me earlier before, you know, <laughs> now I understand. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's just for me, honestly, so much of it is just being a lesbian. Like, honestly, if I, if I had, I feel like, honestly, I would have been pretty satisfied just by the understanding that I would meet my girlfriend pretty shortly and we would be fine and we would have an awesome time. Like, I feel like just that probably would have been plenty. Like, <laughs> like I don't know. It, the whole thing is just so avoidable from so many angles. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, it, it's like, there are so many different angles from which if I had more information or different information at the time, it, it wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. um, do, um, do you think that, do you, do you wish that uh, like you'd had some sort of other therapist going on or do you feel like you just wish you hadn't like heard of the entire like psychiatric apparatus? <laughs> like yeah, sorry know, that's interesting awkwardly phrased no I get it though like I don't know at that point at that point in my life I it was really important to me that mental health professionals did recognize that I was distressed and mm -hmm. when I saw them as you know a teenager who's cutting and who's depressed and who has social anxiety it's like nobody fucking cares you know it's just that is they are not responding to you like your distress is very significant they mm -hmm. are responding to that as honestly very boring <laughs> like like the mental health support i got as a teenager was a, it's you know invalidating sounds vapid but it was you know not that that's the, it was invalidating <laughs> like it was when i when i expressed the problems i was having i got a very clear message that those were silly stupid teenage girl concerns you know uh -huh. um and in terms of if I had encountered a therapist who had interacted with me differently, I don't, I just don't know. I think by the time I learned about transition, I was pretty set on it. And I was, you know, I really, I was an intense person then as well. And I dedicated myself pretty strongly to self-advocating and I got a lot done with that. You know, it's <laughs> my parents were super psyched about it at first. It's not like the doctors wanted to do it. So I might have just barreled through them, honestly. They would have just been a transphobe to me. So. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, I think that uh, you know, you you uh, you said in the book, and I did write this quote down. Um, you said you came to see. You say I came to see my habit of blaming my body as an understandable mistake, and I really liked that because you are sort of extending compassion to your younger self, um, but also realizing that maybe like changing your body doesn't actually make you happy. And you, you extend your critiques of transition sort of to the wider uh, plastic surgery industry as well. Is that, is that yeah. right? Would you say a few words yeah. about that? Yeah, I, yeah, well, okay. So when I got my mastectomy, I was with my partner who was also FTM. So I was, so we were, I was there for, for my partner's vasectomy as well. And there was a lady in the waiting room before who was like there for like breast implants and was like kind of freaking out, kind of melting down in the lobby. Like she was really stressed out about it. And then I saw her after in the recovery room and she was so fucked up. Like it honestly was the way she was behaving, the emotional timber of how she was behaving was the same as when I like sat with women who were like raped the night before you know like mm -hmm. it was honestly really really disturbing and really upsetting and at the time I didn't really have a paradigm for understanding that uh -huh. and I feel like that experience of like seeing a woman I don't know what else she thinks about it and what else happened in her life but having at least at that point an experience of being traumatized by surgery like literally like at the same time as my partner's mastectomy was occurring it was really disturbing for me and I it really made me think about the connections between those things whenever I was actually ready to think about anything <laughs> so mm -hmm. 
yeah, I don't know. I think there's a lot, I think there's a lot there. And I think it's also like a big part of the book to me was contextualizing transition as something that can happen to women and as a female experience and as something that it just gets set apart. It gets set apart in a way that I don't think is honest. Mm-hmm. People want it to be so different from everything else. And I think it's important to people who are transitioning that it be different from everything else, because that's why, you know, your suffering as someone who's FTM is more legitimate than a woman who is going to get breast implants when in reality, I mean, it's just as drastic of a surgery and she's getting it for just as drastic of reasons. It's just, it's just as intense yeah. to her and as real to her as anything else is to someone else. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I think um, you talk about the kind of exceptionalism of the dysphoria framework and thinking like, oh, I don't have like women's problems. I have trans problems and those are like way worse. Yeah, um, yeah. and people do respond that way, you know? Yeah. People care a lot. I mean, the right, obviously some people, <laughs> but Depends. in certain crowds, which if you're doing it, often you're in those crowds, that just you get a lot more uptake people are a lot more interested in your suffering right because it's it's a yeah it's a framework that's very understood in in those crowds not saying before anyone gets mad at me but like obviously yeah. in like the queer and trans scene <laughs> um like like um, we don't know <laughs> like, like we're not aware that it's you know not everyone loves it when you're trans yeah yeah, uh, that's a funny thing. It is. Uh, this is something that is is funny to think about too. Is the fact that it's like, yeah, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of animosity towards trans people in the world at large, and there's a lot of you know people just being like, ah, they're a bunch of perverts, like blah. But like, really, there are these little bubbles that are like, they are very different. Like things, you know, people really idealize it yeah. and like mystify it. And I love how you, I love how you kind of draw it back towards like the the woman who is getting breast implants and towards towards you know the broader like plastic surgery rituals and talk about how it's maybe an experience that is less exceptional maybe people wouldn't want to cut their boobs off but like probably a lot of people can relate to the feeling of like wanting to change their body in a way to make themselves feel better um and yeah. you kind of question whether that is ever the answer. Um, which like, yeah. like, I don't know. It makes sense it? people do it, but it's just like, that's pretty grim, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, this is gonna be, this is gonna be a little more like maybe esoteric, but um, you had a chapter where you talked a lot about Mary Daly. Um, yeah. And I remember, yeah. so I, um, if I can talk about myself for just a second, um, I was very much yeah. like kind of a Tumblr, like a Tumblr feminist in college and stuff and was really soaking in that world and had sort of absorbed this message that was very like, kind of like this like grim, like depressing, but like very surface level feminism. And I remember reading some Mary Daly and I was like, this is so, it was like, because she is, yeah. she's so wild and she's so she has such like a compelling and kooky and like enthralling style and she like even writes in a in an interesting she's 100 percent herself she's yeah she's being herself she could not be anyone else and she's very energized like this is something I appreciate um you know I feel like I had been like absorbing all these messages that were like oh like women in the workplace it sucks and then like to read Mary Daly and have her be like women with a freaking like creators of love you know just like we like it's, yeah just, it's just very energizing and refreshing and it really I don't know I feel like it really shook me um it really kind of I don't know it was good it was like a shot of adrenaline so um uh you you talk about this idea of the the sado ritual Um, and connect that to transition. Would you be willing to say a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, I, I would need, I would have to look it up to remember all the, all the parts that she's got, you know, she's being Mary Daly, she's got all her parts, but yeah, you know, it's just the idea that, that there's ritualized abuse of women in our society that follow specific patterns, and it's just, you know, it's just kind of a way of connecting FTM transition to other forms of female suffering that Daly gets into, you know, it's, like right. it's just the point is just to illustrate what's the same which is kind of a lot you know 
Mm-hmm. Like it's, it just isn't as different as we want it to be. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it seems like there's a way in which, uh, that there's this idea that we sort of find these rituals of like, kind of hurting and like changing the body to sort of direct these energies that would be better spent like resisting environments that just are hostile to us and are right. not working for us it's like it's a mystery yeah it's a misdirecting of it it makes more sense and it's less harmful and it's just living in reality to acknowledge what the problem actually is and it's not it's not how anyone looks you know it's fine mm-hmm. you can look whatever way it's fine so mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah So, um, trying to think which one of these things I want to talk about next. Um, you, you've, you've found a better way of, of like living and enjoying your life. And said a big part of that has been like accepting being a lesbian and like accepting that you like want women to be, you know, the main part of your, your focus. Um, yeah. What, what kinds of, like, what kinds of stuff do you, like, what does that look like for you? Like, how, how has your life changed? Yeah. Um, God, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's just kind of where you put your effort, you know, it's, it's a priority to me to show up for a woman. If there's something, if there's an identifiable thing, you know, it's like we watch some ladies' dogs when there were wildfires here and just, you know, different stuff like that. It's just whatever, if there's opportunities to do stuff for women that's something that makes my life feel meaningful Mm -hmm. um prioritizing relationships with women and working really hard to maintain those and stay up I don't know it's just it's hard right now too because it's like we live in the middle of nowhere so we usually go and visit everyone and like you know it's not really it's not visiting time so it's kind of grim right now frankly Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah um generally it's like we would make it our priority to get to one or two different you know different land stuff in the year stay in touch with everyone I don't know it's nice and just Um, I mean being around other lesbians is just really it's it's been hard because we really haven't we haven't done that to the same extent we usually would because of what's going on and our friends in town for a while we kind of had some like live them buddies you know who were we didn't hide our politics but it didn't come up so we were all kind of no it was it was ignored and then mm-hmm. they did a pediatric transition uh discussion at the library and uh we went and discussed <laughs> <laughs> and then they were all mad at us so we don't really have lesbian friends in town anymore um uh well that's brave of you to go uh show up to an in-person event and uh talk about stuff kiss me off. <laughs> and the actual event went fine honestly like we were perfectly nice at the event like there were there were trans people there there were like parents and just random you know lonely enjoy library events residents of the community and we were all perfectly pleasant to each other. And then someone who was there, who we know, who had not participated at all in the discussion, went and told everyone that me and Kitty were transphobes. So, ah, uh, well, gosh. And that's when the local hormone prescriber unfriended us on Facebook. <laughs> no, not the local hormone prescriber. Yeah, local well. doctors hate this. <laughs> Well, I'm sure that must be. Um, I'm sure that must be a big loss for you and your Facebook feed. <laughs> we actually have their TV still. They had. They were like, "We're going no screens. Whoever gets to our house first can have our flat screen," and we got there first. So we still have the local hormone prescribers TV. I don't even think they live in town anymore. We're rocking it. The TV's amazing. Totally free. That is that is quite a saga, but I'm glad you got a TV out of it. Um, and I'm glad you've been, but... you know, yeah, no, I'm glad you've been sort of speaking, you know, speaking up. And I remember that th- this is not, this is by far not your first time sort of like speaking up and then having a backlash. Like, um, yeah, th- is it? Yeah, uh, maybe- no, the fucking, the Zazzle shit. Everyone, we, we were, uh, so we made, you know, 
I started when I was a teenager to pay for my mastectomy and like uh, at the time college, um, I was selling the print to order whatever shitty Joe Zazzle t-shirts, right? And Kitty does them now because I'm, I'm just tired of it. Um, but uh, when we talked on Tumblr about our beliefs changing and we weren't, you know, so it was so lukewarm. We were like, we were like, there's something funny going on here, basically, uh -huh. <laughs> about the amount of sexual violence that trans women were doing in the scenes we were in. Mm -hmm. And we were so mild. We were like, they're not worse. Nobody's saying they're worse than men. Nobody's saying they are men, but there are some analogous patterns of sexual misconduct and we're all pretending it's not happening, but it very obviously is. Mm -hmm. And everyone freaked. And mm -hmm. we're like, we should, and we're saying we should starve on the streets and we're boycotting our t-shirts and it's like, okay, it's so, <laughs> okay. But we did lose money. I mean, a lot, a lot less sold after that. And people were saying that, um, people were saying that it was a, it was a scam, that it was a transphobic scam. And it's like, I actually got a mastectomy with that. <laughs> like I literally got the t-shirt mastectomy. Like I, I spent <laughs> thousands of dollars that I earned selling shitty t-shirts to get a surgery I regret. So that was real, <laughs> but whatever. Um, so you've, you've, you've weathered many sort of uh, re social rejections because you're willing to speak out about your beliefs. Are you, are you nervous That's about this them. book <laughs> That's coming a lot out? Of them. Uh, like, do you, are you worried about, about the book? This book? Oh no, they all hate me already. Everyone, everyone who hates me already hates me because it's never been something that was really private. You know, it's like I won't, I don't make everyone talk about it. But if you force the topic, I'm not going to pretend I don't have the opinions I have. You know, I will mm -hmm. avoid the topic as long as everyone else avoids it. But once you bring it up, it's kind of on you at that point. So everyone who'd be pissed about the book knows. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's really nothing to take from me. Well, it's very freeing to just be like, all right, this is what I believe. And, you know, I, I, it was not me. I, I don't remember the name of the woman who said this, but she was like, what are you going to do? Cut off my boobs again? Like, <laughs> like it doesn't, it's just not that big <laughs> yeah, of a deal. Yeah, yeah, that's what's up. Yeah, um, and it's like, I mean, I wouldn't put myself in a position where I could get screwed by you know it's like I'm not taking a I wouldn't take a job not that I we qualified anyways but it's like I'm not taking a job at a university I'm not working for a nonprofit that would kick me if they found out this stuff you know it's like I just wouldn't set up my life in a way where it would make me vulnerable so it's like when we were doing well we had an adult foster home for development of disabled people for a little bit and it's like I was a little nervous when that was going on because it's like at that point there's other people living in the house who harassment could affect Mm -hmm. um but it turned out I couldn't do that and we just shut it down so uh that was the only thing <laughs> now there's now there's nothing I don't give a fuck so do whatever come and get me um so besides the haters of which there is always annoying throngs who who do you hope will read this book like what who's who's the kind of audience that you're really hoping to reach yeah. so I mean it was the only way that I could really write it in the way that I wanted to do it was by focusing on like a lesbian audience as the audience that I have in mind. Mm -hmm. um, but I would hope, the hope would be that in doing so, you can kind of produce a work that's true to what you want to say in a way that appeals more broadly, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would hope it's useful for women in general. Or, or you know, I, if, if a man wanted to read it, I, I would hope he liked it. Um, not sh not sure what it'd be up to but best wishes right yeah um, yeah I think um I mean speaking speaking as a not a lesbian it's a really good book and I, I really took a lot out of it um and I think I'm really glad your you know your dedication to your dedication to like the messy truth of everything you've gone through and the hard-earned lessons that you have produced from that is really powerful. Um, I wanted to I wanted to do another quote from the book, if you don't mind. Um, you're talking about the Kira Bell case. Um, and you said something that I think was is powerful as well um, is uh, you said, this is what is possible when women politicize what happens to us. 
Bell's actions forced the institution responsible to acknowledge what happened to her was a possible outcome. Blockers and testosterone are not without risk. No aspect of medical transition is. Um, so why is it important to politicize medical transition or like politicize detransition? Because it happens, you know, like, because it's real. Like, it's just not, it's not honest for people to want to live in a world where this doesn't happen and doesn't harm people. That's not, we, it did happen and it did harm people. And of course it's significant to the particular people that it harmed. And they, it's just, it should not be an option to pretend that this never happens and that it's not going to happen more as the numbers of people transitioning increase and as there are less barriers to transition. It's, it's, it's a real thing. <laughs> so you have to deal with it because that's the world you live in. Like, it's real. That's why it matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because, yeah, people's, everyone's outcomes matter and, and having those be added to the conversation rather than swept away into a little corner of like, oh, statistically insignificant doesn't happen. Well, it's so fucking ridiculous for that to be coming from trans people. It's like, if, if being, if being a tiny minority means that it doesn't fucking matter, then the whole, we can just, we can forget the whole issue. We can just forget the whole thing, you know? Like that, yeah. that's very silly. It's silly for a group that's like, you know, 1% of the population to be like 1% of, of a population doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. That's nonsense. Yeah. And I'll be surprised if detransitioners really are only 1% of the population of transitioners, but <laughs> right? even if- Well, cause it's like, how do you define it? It's like, if you're, if you're, if you're using it to describe everyone who is on testosterone and doesn't take it for the rest of their life, that's, that's so many people. If it's everyone who used pronouns for a while and doesn't now, it's just, it's kind of undefinable, but any definition you use is going to capture any reasonable definition you use is going to capture a pretty significant group of people. And if you combine all the different ones, it comes out to a pretty significant group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it's important, it's important to kind of shake up the idea that there's like this gender identity that you just find in yourself and then you're good. <laughs> and then that's an important step. Like, um, it's, it's, it's like, that's not really how it works for everyone. That's probably not really how it yeah, works Yeah, like, for that's anyone. not my story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, that, if that's someone else's story they really need to tell, then they need to tell it, but that's not what happened to me. And mm -hmm. I have to make sense of reality, starting with my own experience as the basis. And that version that, that they have based on their story is totally unintelligible from my perspective. It, it makes no sense to me at this point, you know? Mm -hmm. I get to say my version too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I don't know if you if you have any kind of like closing thoughts on like what what you are hoping the impact of this book is and like what the impact you know has been for you in writing it. Either one of those things. Like what what would you like people to know? I just, I'd like it to be useful. You know, I would like it. I would like it to be useful because even in the context of having peer support, it's everyone's experience of this is so different that knowing 20 women who have been through it is knowing 20 women, you know, so just everyone, I don't know, the more cultural output there is about an experience, the easier it is to find something that's useful to you personally. I would hope it would be useful to someone. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, honestly, it was a tremendous amount of work. It's crazy how much work it is. It's like this tiny little book is very, is not visually impressive in terms of a representation of how much work goes into a book. It's crazy. And I screwed up the citations and we had to go back and do them all again. It's like everything that I could have done to make this more tedious and more work I did. I, I don't know. I hope it, I hope it's useful. Ah. Uh. Well, I really appreciate you going through it. I can't imagine how much work it is, but it's it really is an amazing book. And just speaking as someone who 
has benefited, um, as I told you off camera, I've really benefited from your writings when I was going through detransition, when you sort of had these like smaller projects and zines and like blogs, like having that kind of material out there from someone who's been through what you're currently struggling with and like seeing what conclusions they drew and how they kind of rebuilt their life is so, so helpful and powerful. And I think this book is just like a whole nother level of a really, really useful sort of, I don't know, roadmap of how you got through it and how you made sense of things. And I think that's gonna resonate for a lot of people in a really powerful and helpful way. So I really thank you for writing it. Um, I'm really glad that it's gonna be out there. It's, it's nice to hear it. Um, do you have, do you have like a copy of the book that we can show our viewers? Here's the book. All right. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So the transition beyond before and after. Well, um, it's a beautiful book. Um, I'll make sure to put the link in the description of where you can get it. And also, um, Max's, uh, probably zine press and I guess whatever, wherever else people should try to find you if they need to find you on the internet, maybe nowhere, it's up to you. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, ask, ask Kitty, good God, I don't know anything. <laughs> Thanks. Um, thank you so much for, for writing such a wonderful book, Max, and congratulations. Congratulations on your publication. And I look forward to hearing what everyone else thought of it because I really loved it.